Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our panelists today. We have a very diverse and interesting uh, set of speakers. We're going to talk about quite different topics, but I think we're all going to learn something really amazing today about pedagogy. So uh, allow me to start by introducing uh, Dr. James Arvanakakis. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, I should have checked with you beforehand. Um, Dr. Arvanatakis uh, is a Fulbright James. James. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> James is a Fulbright Fellow at the University of Wyoming. His substantial position is the Pro Vice Chancellor, Research and Graduate Studies at Western Sydney University. So he's actually uh, from Australia, and uh, fortunately for us, spending some time in North America this year. He's a lecturer in the humanities and a member of the university's Institute for Culture and Society, and the founder of the Academy which received an Australian Financial Review Higher Education Excellence Award in 2016. Congratulations on that. James is internationally recognized for his innovative teaching style and was the recipient of the Prime Minister's University Teacher of the Year Award in 2012 and an Eminent Researcher Award from the Australia India Education Council in 2015. James is going to be sharing strategies with us this morning to address the social, economic and technological disruption in our environment. Very pleased to have you. I'm going to go ahead and introduce all three panelists, and then we'll call on James to start us off. The mic is not working. It's on. <coughs> there we go. All right. Sorry about that. Um, I'd, ne I'd like to now introduce Dr. Peter Felton. Peter is the executive director of the Center for Engaged Learning the Assistant Provost for Teaching and Learning, and a Professor of History at Elon University. He works with colleagues on institution-wide teaching and learning initiatives and on the scholarship of teaching and learning. As a teacher and mentor, he regularly writes and presents with Elon undergraduates, and he works with Elon College Honors Fellows on their research. As a scholar, he is particularly interested in learning and teaching, individual and institutional change, student experience, and agency on higher education. Peter will be speaking about the, how the future of teaching and learning in higher education is relationship rich. These relationships can ensure that students experience welcome and care, become inspired to learn, cultivate constellations of mentors, and explore the big questions that matter for their lives and our communities. So welcome, Peter. I'd also like to welcome Dr. Lindsay Morcom. She's an interdisciplinary researcher with experience in education, Aboriginal languages, language revitalization, and linguistics. Lindsay joins us from Queens, where she coordinated the campus-based and community-based Aboriginal teacher education program for five years. She's now an associate professor and Canada Research Chair in language revitalization and decolonization education. She is of Anishinaabe heritage and is a member of Ardoc Algonquin First Nation. She earned her master's degree in linguistics at First Nations University through the University of Regina in 2006 and completed a doctorate in general linguistics and comparative philology as a Rhodes Scholar at Oxford University in 2010. Lindsay will be speaking about Indigenous pedagogy, which is an innovative, relational, holistic approach to education that centers on learner transformation. Please join me in welcoming all three of our guest speakers. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, so I'm going to speak slowly and without using Australian slang, because I was told uh, the other day that no one understands a word that I say in my classes, but they're fascinated by my... Uh, well, my accent. So uh, um, I want to begin by thanking you all for um, inviting me to be here today. I'm always very humbled to stand in the room full of colleagues and to share ideas and I feel um, very lucky to be here. Um, so thank you for inviting me uh, along and also I want to begin by acknowledging the First Nations. Uh, it's a process that we follow in Australia as well and I think it's a very important process to acknowledge that we stand on, um, on the rich, rich history um, of uh, First Nations peoples, and, build, and we and we hopefully um, make the make them proud of what we do here as an educational institute. Um, so I want to um, talk about 
Looking ahead, um, I've been involved recently in a bunch of um, strategic planning processes with my university, and so I want to talk about some of the things that we did, and hopefully some of the um, maybe lessons you can you can learn looking ahead. Just a little bit about Sydney to contextualise. Um, so Sydney is a long, big, sprawling city of five million people, much like London. Um, what you need to know about Sydney is probably in a 20 uh, kilometre radius from the city centre is where the wealth is. This area here, basically starting up from here all the way down to here, has been traditionally an area of exclusion, an area of poverty and an area where to put it in perspective, and this is a pretty stark way to put it, it basically only got sewerage in like the early 70s. Right? So it was essentially relied on septic tanks. This is where my university is based. Right? It was known as Western, University of Western Sydney, UWS, which uh, the acronym stood for. Um, students would say, you went, and you can fill in the last word. Right? That's what the S stood for. So uh, about, about 10 years ago, the university was seen as basically the university of second choice or third choice, the last chance university. And we went, well, we owe it to our current students and we owe it to our alumni and we owe it to our future students to be seen as being part of a world-class university. So we implemented a number of strategies. Now, within that context, there are four big challenges that I think generally universities face that actually assisted us in making those, that, that drove the way we were thinking. Okay, the first challenge was basically a, a, a growing, a government that was increasingly cutting budgets across all universities. Some of the most important programs that I felt were being cut, the arts programs, um, some of the funding in, um, in, in indigenous studies, languages and so on was, was changing. At the same time, the, universe, the government made it very clear that if some universities had to go bust, or you know, go bust, yeah, yep, okay, not an Australianism, okay, good, um, or had to merge, they were comfortable with that, okay? And this fitted in with a, a, a paper at the time by McKinsey's that said that 20% of universities across the world are vulnerable to disappearing, right? One in five, it's incredible. The second change was changing expectations and trust. And we've seen over the last specifically decade a decline in trust in the way that, um, that our pub, the, the public expects from us, but also a decline in ec the, the trust of expertise. And climate change um, and in Australia, massive rejection of vaccinations and, and other sort of expert systems that's created a massive gap between the university and, and um, the, the general public. The third change was the, 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 the third big challenge was changing employer demands. The em employees in increasingly criticised universities for saying that our students were not job ready, that they, we, we weren't giving them the skills to get them to jump in um, and, and start working straight away. And I found this a really interesting tension between what employers wanted and what was the traditional role of universities. And the fourth challenge was just uncertainty. The, the, the way that our, um, our, our student body and also our, our staff felt uncertain about the future, how they were thinking to themselves, well, what does the future hold? What job will I have? This job that looked like I was going to have um, has disappeared. My, my dad was a, worked for, this, for the, this financial institution his whole life and he's been made redundant. So what jobs are left for me? And also the staff being expected to, um, to accommodate these, this changing environment. So now there is an interesting Carlton uh, Western Sydney University link when I looked at the history of Carlton. Right? Again, that history of a university that's there to serve a certain percentage of the population. And so again, like, like, um, like, uh, Western, Sydney, like, like Western Sydney in a way, where you were kind of like seen as a university of, of, of a third choice or last chance, in a way, I was really proud of that, that you, the, the university offered a pathway for others who didn't make it. But that didn't mean that we, didn't, we couldn't be a world-class university. People saw a tension between being a world-class research institute, world-class teaching institute, and offering pathways for non-traditional students. 40% right? of our students are first in family to go to university. 25% are from low socioeconomic status backgrounds. But that doesn't, doesn't remove the opportunity to be seen as being a world-class institute. That tension for me was a false divide. Right? And so that was a, that's what drove our thinking in the programs that we did. And the academy was one of those programs. So how did we respond? Well, I want to talk about four st strategies that we've employed that I think have helped the institute 
rise both in the estimation as uh, reputation wise um, in what we do for our students but also as a world class institution and I'm not a fan of metrics but we have seen our metrics inc improve incredibly over the last say 10 years to now be in the top 2% of universities. Like I said, I'm not a fan of those metrics but it's the, an imperfect system that we all have to live with. So the first thing is we stood around and we went, okay, what makes us unique? What is it about our university that makes us unique? And what we looked at was we looked at the, the traditional universities, the equivalent of the, um, of the Harvards at Sydney were known as the GO8, the group of eight. And we went, we're not going to be those guys. In fact, we don't want to be those guys. They've got their own gig. Let them play with their own stuff and their beautiful old buildings. That's great. Right? They haven't got air conditioning, we do, right? But, <laughs> but, um, but, but uh, we looked at that and we went, we don't, we don't want to be in that field, so what do we want to do? Well, we basically said we wanted to be the university of the people. We want to be a university of social justice. We want to be the university that made change, that had impact. We wanted our university to influence lives, the communities around us, both locally, nationally and globally. Right? So we have a peri-urban research institute that looks at feeding growing populations on urban edges. Right? That's what we do, and we do it well. And that's what we decided to focus in on. We have a university that deals with a huge level of diversity. We, one, of our, uh, one suburb alone, we have 198 different languages spoken. So let's be the university that talks about multiculturalism and diversity and strength. We have, the, we have the, the largest urban population of First Nations people. Let's have an institute that focuses on meeting the demands of that, uh, that, that, that First Nations people. Right? So we went through Unique and we, we, we worked with students, students like Jen Armstrong, a victim of domestic violence who set up a, 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 a charity to help survivors of domestic violence. So we've, we, we've made her program and the work that she did part of our curriculum. Then I do it, a refugee who became a lawyer, right, who became world famous in his journey. We worked with him to meet, to, to, to deliver refugee scholarships. We worked with him to, to break the barriers between a growing distrust of refugees and, and the, the local population. So we specifically targeted, we are the university of justice, we are the university of the people, let's do that. Right? And there's a whole bunch of strategies that come about that. And it wasn't just our teaching, but it was our research. So we have things like research impact competitions. We encourage our staff to think about any research you do, what does it mean? What does it mean for our population, our, 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 the people around us? The second thing that we did is we looked at this idea of scholarship and citizenship. And we went, those two things about encouraging, encouraging our students to be future focused and having an obligation to the community they belong to and also being scholars, robust scholars, those two things aren't intention. In fact, those two things work very, very well together. Okay, and, um, and so we actually designed the, what we call the, a research-led pedagogy and the Citizen Scholar Program. And I acknowledge my, my colleague and co-writer, uh, Dr. David Hornsby, who we worked with quite um, closely together to develop models like this, when at the middle is citizenship and scholarship. But surrounded with that, within our curriculum, Right? What we need to do is we need to build in certain kinds of citizenship and, and future-based skills. So we looked at literacy, including not just reading and writing, but dealing with changing technologies. We looked at the things like mistakeability. We, we, we have a program where we have a, we have, I introduced a subject where I made it basically impossible for students to pass. And so what I graded them on, well, I didn't actually grade them, but what we, we assessed them on was not if they got it right, Right? But what they did when it went wrong, we looked at process, not outcome. Right? So a whole bunch of programs like that. So the third thing is was research-led teaching. And this was a, the main program I was working on when I, when I, when I went away, when I, when I left to, to, to take up the, 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 the Fulbright. Research-led teaching was saying, okay, we have, we have world-class researchers. How do we build what they do into the curriculum? But we also have people who are basically teachers Right, who aren't that interested in teach in, in research, but they are constantly updating the curriculum with cool and fun stuff. Let's recognize that teaching scholarship as research. They're writing cutting edge textbooks. They're right, they're bringing in all these new ideas. That is that is teach that is research. It's a different type of research. But also the, the, the world class researchers, let's get them in the room with our with our with our designers of curriculum and get them to help develop the curriculum. And the fourth part I want to talk, uh, I, I really focused in on 
is the idea that we as academics, as professors, as, as educators, have to be what we want our students to be. So we can't say, we can't stand at the front with like 400 PowerPoint slides and talk to the slides and say to our students, now you go out and be innovative, right? We have to be innovative. We have to take risks. We have to reflect what we want them to be. And if we could do that, then that will reflect onto the students. So part of this, the idea of doing this, was taking our, 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 our cohort, our, our, our teachers, our educators, our researchers, onto the journey with the students. So it's not, a, again, it's not two different journeys. It's the same journey. And so this became really, uh, this, this became one of the challenges because we had people in the room that didn't want to change. Uh, and so it was like, okay, how, do we, how do we take people with us? And one of the ways that I've heard a university described is um, a university is like, each academic is like an individual franchise holder. Right, and the, the role of the university is, to, is, is the franchise is the franchise owner to get all the franchise holders to go in the same direction. But each one is an individual business, right? And so, in a way, I mean, it's a pretty it's a pretty crazy way to look at it. But in a way, you kind of understand it. People have their own research and their own priorities, and and and, and it's a bit of a challenge. And so, it's like, okay, well, how do we take people to, to be to go on that journey with us? So, how do we have a shared vision? And that's where that's where massive amounts of cultural change happened. And again, we see this happening now, um, some of the benefits of the university, but it was a 10-year project. It was a 10-year project to get people to work together, to create um, uh, um, communities of practice, to share ideas and to, to change the curriculum and, and build in the research and have the researchers acknowledge the educators and educators acknowledge the researchers and break down that force divide. So that's 15 minutes. I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Peter Felton again from Iman University in North Carolina. And I want to first say thanks for having me. It's an honor to be here. It's an honor to be between James and Lindsay. Um, and as a historian, one of the things I appreciate, in the US, we tend not to do land acknowledgments because we're always like running forward and trying to avoid Trump. But. Um, <laughs> shouldn't say that. Um, but one of the things I appreciate as a historian is this long perspective. I was talking to a student at Western University in June, an indigenous student, and he said that what he tried to do is think back seven generations and forward seven generations. And, and I think that's really a powerful thing to think about with what we want out of our education. What do we want out of our university? Um, not because I, I get frustrated sometimes. James was talking about what employers want. That's important. But that's not the only reason we're here. And um, there's a really interesting thinker in the US. His name's Ibu Patel. And he says the universities in the US are essentially the only institution left that thinks long term. And so how do we think not just about these students and their first jobs or their first citizen actions, but how do we think about their children and their grandchildren in the world we're helping them create, right? Um, and the quick version for me of the answer to this around teaching and learning is that the future of teaching and learning is human. Shocking, right? It's relationship rich. Um, student faculty relationships, student staff relationships are key, but even more important, probably student student relationships. And recognizing that and centering what we do in teaching and learning, everything we do on teaching and learning around relationships, I think is essential for the future of effective teaching and learning and essential for the future of our students, our communities, in some ways, our world. Um, the research I'm going to talk just really briefly about is for a book a colleague and I are writing will be out next spring, Canadian time early summer North Carolina time. Uh, I'm sorry? Canadian dollars? Canadian dollars? I'm, I'm sure it will be cheap. I would be happy to give you a copy. Um, Johns Hopkins is publishing it, and you know, I'm a terrible capitalist. So who knows how that works? But the book, in the book, we, we were trying to wrestle with the challenge, which is we know if you actually, if you read the research, at least in the United States, and I want to recognize the research I'm presenting is all from the United States, different contexts. But if you read the research in the United States, it is so clear 
that relationships are absolutely essential to everything good that happens in teaching and learning. Everything. This list of things, this is a synthesis if you know American higher education research. This is the book How College Affects Students, the third edition of it, the original Pasquarell and Terenzini book. Um, this list could be a lot longer, but the slide got really ugly. So think about anything from learning to persistence and outcomes to well-being, belonging, to are students likely to vote after they graduate? Are they likely to feel like they're thriving after they graduate? The most important factors are the quality, not the quantity, the quality of their relationships with, with faculty and staff and with peers, right? And so where this book project came from was a frustration that we know this is true, we just don't act like it's true. We don't design our courses, we don't design our curriculum, we don't design our universities um, as if it were true. And we wanted to make the case that we can and we should. So we flew all over the US, we interviewed about 400 people, a little more than 200 students with a strong bias towards first gen students and students of color to ask them what their experiences were like. And so I'll give you a little bit of research and some of their voices, right? One thing to know about this, and that in the US at least gets neglected, is that we forget that the classroom can and should be a relationship rich space. What a lot of US universities do is they have really awesome programs that surround students because they don't want to touch the classroom. Because that's the faculty domain. But the classroom is where the heart of action is in university. So if we ignore the classrooms, we're, we're missing the point entirely. And we're also missing how important faculty are. This is one of my favorite quotes from a student, Jose Robles. He's a nursing student at Nevada State College. Um, he had to take a gen ed science course. So he took this geology course because it was at the right time in his schedule. Can you all see the... And even something as boring as rocks can be interesting, right? And why that's interesting is, it's his words, not, well, um, both how the faculty is in the classroom, right? Her passion in this case, but even more important, how she sets up the classroom, how she teaches it, how she assesses it and everything. So she made us interact with each other, right? So faculty are the primary actors in many ways of making universities relationship rich. And we're doing a lousy job of it right now. At least the research suggests this. This is a study um, from, that was published in Science in 2018 last year. Two or three of these universities were in Canada. And what this says in a nutshell, this was observational. So trained researchers were going in and observing four different class sections during a semester. More than half of what they observed, there was no meaningful interaction at all between students or between faculty and students. Asking any questions does not count as meaningful interaction. Nothing, right? So classrooms are essential. Classrooms are not necessarily relationship rich. Y'all are welcome to have my slides too. Um, and this is a problem, and this is particularly a problem. It's a problem for all of our students. It's a particularly pro a problem for students who don't feel like they belong in higher education. Or students who actually, the literature suggests, is a belonging uncertainty, right? So it's not that I know I don't belong, I'm just not quite sure. Let me give you an example from Khadija Sai, who is a student at um, Bryn Mawr College, a selective liberal arts college. And she told us this. Can you all read this or do you want me to read it? You can see it? She didn't go to class the rest of that day, and she felt deeply alienated from her campus, which is actually representationally a quite diverse campus. A lot of international students, a lot of students of color, but she didn't feel like she belonged in the classroom. She didn't feel like she was acknowledged in the classroom on that day. And it, it comes down to, there's a lot of research on this, but Matt Smith at Cal State Dominguez Hills put it better than the research does. 
Students need to feel like we care about more than just them as learners. We need to care about them as humans. The, the best research on this is by, in the US is by a scholar named Laura Rendon. Her theory is called validation. And the key part about validation theory is it is on institutional actors. It is on us to validate students' presence in the classroom. And that doesn't mean this is kindergarten and everybody comes in and gets a hug and everyone goes out and gets a hug. Validation all fundamentally involves articulating high standards and then belief in every student's capacity to meet those standards. Right? In the US, the research is quite clear, especially men of color. If they think you're lowering standards because who they are, they're alienated by that. Right? So it's key to have high standards and to express those and to express confidence in everyone's ability to meet those standards. Does that make sense? And it's really about recognizing whole humans rather than just history students. So how do you do this? Well, I'm not going to tell you exactly how to do this because Carlton is big and complex and there's lots of different ways. I want to just play with four quick themes of things to think about as you do this. Right? Um, and the first, all of them in some ways come through faculty, but the first one is the only one that is faculty centric. Because one of the points I want to leave you with is relationship rich education is not scalable if every faculty member, every teacher, has to have an individual one on one relationship with every student. They outnumber us, right? And in the future, they will outnumber us probably even more. Right? So what we need to do is we need to build strong relationships with students. In, in a broader thing, we could talk later about how we think about mentoring. And some of the really interesting research we've encountered is about what is called mentors of the moment. So having a mentor is powerful and is good and should be an aspiration for every college student and every institution should try to make sure their students have mentors. But what students really need is people around them who can ask them the right question, challenge them, support them just in the right way at just the right time. Right? So not a lasting relationship, but sort of a cultural relationship. So what do we do? Well, one thing we do has to run through faculty and then three things are shaped by what faculty do, but are really about peers. The first thing that has to run through faculty, and this seems so silly, because it seems so small, is we have to pretend like we care to know their names. The research is really clear. You don't actually have to know your students' names for them to work harder for you in the class and feel valued. They just have to think you care to know their names. This study comes out of Arizona State University, which is gigantic. The really interesting magic of this study is they found the most effective intervention to get students to think you knew their names was to ask students to make name tense and then to use them in class. This was in classes of four or five hundred students. And the, this paper is hilarious because they have these quotes from students saying, we thought this was stupid, we thought it was the first day only, and the professor's like, no, keep bringing them out. But what happens then is the professor can try to use your name or say, I can't quite read your name. What is your name? Right? But even more powerful than this was that students could use each other's names. Because what you find in group work at many universities in the US, at least, is students will work together and they don't actually know each other's names. There's a wonderful line in here from a student saying, it's so much easier saying, hey, David, could we study together than, hey, could we study together? So part of this is names. But that's really the one thing we most have to do. The other things are sort of structural things faculty can do. Second is support students in working productively with peers. That is hard. Students in the US, at least, often don't like group work. Right? Um, there's lots of research about social loafing and things like this, you know, where the smart kid does the work and everybody else just um, thinks about skating on the canal or whatever. Um, Tim Horton, whatever Canadians do, right? <laughs> right? Um, but there's fascinating research where if you dig into what happens in student groups, it turns out student groups in classes are just like other groups of humans. 
right? And, and so instead of students thinking, I hate group work, what they don't like is they don't like when they're in a setting where someone is bullying them or someone, they don't feel like they have a voice or they don't know why they're doing what they're doing. Right? And so what we need to do if we're going to ask our students to work in groups is help them be in groups in ways where the one female identifying student in a group of five students in a physics class feels like she has a voice and her voice matters. That the students feel like what they're doing is purposeful. That the guy who just keeps talking and talking and talking, there's a way the group can constrain that. And we can't expect our students to bring those skills necessarily into our courses. So how do we help them develop those skills? And notice what happens when you do that. They learn more. It's a more relationship-rich environment. Plus, they're developing skills that are going to be useful throughout their lives while they're learning history or biology or chemistry or whatever it is. So that's the second thing. Is think about how we use groups, but not just sort of willy-nilly throw them in. Third. And I think this is the most challenging part of the research, but it's the most powerful new research coming out, is think about collaborative assessments. In the US, the tradition in higher education is individual assessments, right? You do everything to earn your grade. Even if you do group work, it's all individual. Well, there's increasing research. It started in part of it out of UBC um, with Carl Wyman, who won a Nobel in physics and put all his Nobel money into physics education to look at collaborative testing. Now, so and in collaborative testing, you're not necessarily throwing out the traditional way of doing a test. A Wyman version of collaborative testing is you give a test. If you have a 90-minute class session, you give a test like you would ordinarily. Individually, students do the test for 55 minutes, let's say. It's about 80% of their grade on the exam. Then there's five minutes of chaos while students turn in their individual exams. Each, they go into groups that are pre-formed that they've been working in all term. And the group has half an hour to do a collaborative exam. That includes two different kinds of questions. One are sort of the key points you want every student having really understood in the exam. And then the second is extensions, more complicated things than they could do individually. Um, the knock on, and that's worth about 20% of your grade. The knock on this always was, again, the students who are most prepared are going to do the work and the other students aren't going to learn anything. So there's been quite a lot of research. This is um, a new paper on this that reinforces what a number of different papers say. Let me just tease this apart a little bit. What it says at the top is that students who perform best on the individual exam tend not to do much better on the group exam. Everybody else does better on the group exam. Maybe that's a concern, although I'm not that good at statistics, but if you get a 98 out of 100 on the individual exam, the margin for you to move up is pretty small. And if you get a 68, the margin to move up is larger, right? So it's not that surprising that students who do poorer on the individual portion would do better. The heart of this, though, is that everybody learns higher order knowledge, skills, capacities from the collaborative exam. Everybody, regardless of previous academic ability. So again, collaborative testing. So rethinking how we assess our students, because that drives how they behave, <laughs> drives their motivation, drives everything else. And employers would say this is preparing students for the world they're going to work in. Though, my last of our four recommendations here is to rethink how we think of our students and what their roles are in, in this work. Um, in many universities in the US, there are tutoring centers and writing centers and things like this, often staffed by professionals with some student assistance. The most powerful work we saw around the country is learning assistant programs. So these are peers. Let's say someone takes my history course one year, and the next year in my 200 student history course. And the next year, I hire her back as a learning assistant. She comes into the class once a week. As students are working on projects in the class, she floats around and helps them and challenges them and whatnot. And she has office hours where she's available to them outside of class. 
Students are much more likely to go to their peers for help than they are to go to faculty. Um, we're scary. Peers aren't. The best learning assistant programs in the US also don't hire the absolute highest scoring students. They hire students who struggle and then do well. So Rosa Espinal is an example of this. She, we interviewed her. She's at Florida International University. She was, was taking an anatomy course. She got a 50 on the first test. She ended up getting a B in the course. She was a learning assistant the next year. After the first test, the student came in in tears who had gotten a 60 on the first test. And Rosa said, I didn't tell her. I did worse. But they talked together about Rosa's strategies and this student's strategies. And that student felt empowered. She felt there was a peer who could help her. Things did better, right? So thinking again about the role of students as allies in each other's learning, not just people we have to force to learn. All of this comes back to bell hooks and other critical pedagogy folks who just remind us that the way learning works in education in educational systems often is not the way learning works in human systems. <laughs> Outside of universities, learning is almost always collaborative, not private, individualistic, and competitive. So how do we make our classrooms and our university more like the rest of the universe in that way? And just one last line, because I want to close from a student, a community college student, to remind you, I love Gina reminding me, what we do with students, what we say to students, the capacities we help them see in themselves are absolutely transformation. Gina was one of my favorite students to interview. When you interview American community college students about their education, often they start by saying, I wasn't a very good student in high school. Gina, she had this experience. She introduced herself, I'm going to be an orthopedic surgeon. I'm the first in my family to go to college, and I'm going to be an orthopedic surgeon. And having students know that and believe that, partly because the professor said, when you do this. The difference between using the word if and when when we talk to students is unbelievable. So there's lots of research. I'm happy to talk more, but it's Lindsay's turn. Thank you very much. All right, so Ani Buju, a good on Queen Dejnikaz, Marco and Odem, got a rock and Dunjaba, Ogimakwe Chikinima Gagame Gandano Ki. So, my English name's Lindsay Morcom, my spirit name means the woman in the bay, and I'm Algonquin Nishinabe Kwe. I live in Kingston. Um, and I do want to again repeat the acknowledgement that this is unceded traditional and current territory of the Nishinabe Algonquin people. Um, I also want to acknowledge that uh, with this presentation, uh, I took it to our elder in residence, Deb Cinemont, so I want to acknowledge that she had input and was a guiding force behind this. She is with basically all my teaching, so I'm really grateful for that. So I'm going to be talking today. Um, in 15 minutes, I'm going to tell you about 15 to 20,000 years of indigenous intellectual history on this land. Take a breath. <laughs> um, but essentially, um, I'll be focusing on Anishinaabe pedagogy because that's the land that we're on and that's the culture that I carry as well. With a little bit of Mohawk thrown in because I live on shared territory. Um, but essentially, Anishinaabe indigenous pedagogy is learner -cent or holistic and relational, land-based and territory connected, spirited and learner-centered. And I think that that actually goes really well with what the other two speakers have talked about, that really excellent pedagogy looks like this. So we're very lucky that our culture builds that in. Um, so when I say holistic and relational, Holistic is a big term, and it really does comprise the structure of Anishinaabe knowledge. So it became really clear to me while I was working on this how epistemology and the structure of knowledge informs pedagogy. Um, so it goes beyond cross-curricular learning. We hear about that. But really, it's holism within the person. So if you think back to your best um, educational experience, it probably wasn't sitting in a straight row, silent at a desk, right? It probably did inform you intellectually, which is what we're doing here, but it probably touched you emotionally. It probably had you doing something, and it probably was taught in a way that honored the knowledge that you were, that you were engaging with. And so the best teaching is teaching that encompasses all four areas of the person. Western academia, and re really even from the, little t from the little ones, we focus on this one and this one. We teach you how to think, and we teach you how to do. 
but we also need to teach how to feel and teach how to honor, and that is what makes a holistic learning experience within the person. And then it connects outwards. So um, it connects us to our families, our communities, other forms of life. So the way that we interact with other forms of life is a bit different from Western ways of thinking. There's not dominion, there's, there's cooperation and relationality. And we're connected to the earth as well. So we are the earth, right? Our people have been on this land since the glaciers receded. So our culture has developed in this place in relation to this place. And so when we think about relationships, it really does have to relate to Aki, to the earth as well. Um, and then, of course, to the creator. And there's a focus on responsibilities. So it moves away from it's my right to learn this to what are my responsibilities when I pick up this knowledge bundle and I move it forward? How can I serve these other uh, entities with that? So with that as well, the way of thinking is not compartmentalized into subjects which is really awkward in Western education where our buildings are compartmentalized into subjects, right? It's written into the architecture of the place. Um, but it does present us with some great opportunities. So I don't know about you guys, but when you're applying for CIRC, CAHR, NCIRC, they're looking for cross-curricular. And it's a really wise way to go about learning, thinking about how we're connected to each other, get you out of the navel gazing and into a, a broader way of looking. And so because it's holistic, it's land-based and territory connected. So we think a lot about what are our relationships to Aki, Aki being land, but also sort of greater environment, right? The place where we are. Um, our language, our culture, and our philosophy are rooted in land and are of the land. So uh, when you learn Anishinaabemowin, for example, it gives you ways of thinking about land and thinking about places that are not present in the English language. Um, so when we get our students out, when we take them out on the land, which you can do, in a post-secondary class, right? Harder when you have 500 students. But I teach at least one teaching block out on land. I get them out there, and in 20 below, they laugh at me because I show up in ski pants and mitts, and they tell me, you look like my mom. Look, yeah, we're yeah. the same age, that's why. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's one of those things where you can really get them thinking about how to take knowledge outside of the classroom and root it in life and in land. Um, when I talk about land-based as well, it's really important to think about the diversity of indigenous peoples. So the diversity is really, really significant. Um, in Canada, we have about 60 different language groups, 11 language families. Language families mean that cultures and languages are unrelated. So I live in Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe territory. They are as different linguistically and culturally as English and Mandarin, right? Totally night and day, totally different structures. We have 11 of those in Canada, 60 languages belonging to them. In North America, 290 language groups. So the diversity of languages and cultures is tremendous, so it needs to be localized as well. Um, we also get a questioning of the idea of universalism. So Western thought tends to be oriented towards universal truths, right? So even if you think Western spirituality, it tends to be more universalist. Whereas indigenous ways of understanding truth and connection are particularist. So what is true in Anishinaabe territory may not be true in Tlingit territory, may not be true in Mayan territory, right? So our truths are rooted in land, which is different. And it's spirited. Again, this connects to land um, in that, I, I'm sure you guys have seen this symbol, the medicine wheel. You always see it hanging up in two dimensions, but it's not two dimensional. What it actually is is a sacred cosmology. So you pick it up and you lay it on the land, right? And we've got a map of the, starting in the east where the sun starts, to the south, to the west, and the north. And then it's three dimensional. And these are connected to our seven grandfather teachings as well. So um, <laughs> humility, honesty, respect, bravery, wisdom, truth, and love. And these are pedagogical philosophies, right? If I teach, centering these teachings and centering the whole, the whole of the person connected to land, then I'm teaching in an indigenous way. Does that make sense? So when we think of a spirited epistemology, Marie Baptiste's work on this is second to none. So you can um, definitely refer particularly to her 2013 book. But we understand spirit and animacy in a really connected way. So understanding land as spirited, right? That's, that, that land has spirit. Rocks in our language are grammatically animate um, because of the relationship that we have with Earth. Um, understanding language as spirit as well. So the ways that we convey thought to one another are dependent on language. Um, we see storytelling as pedagogy. So 
our culture has two kinds of stories. We've got Dabaj Muin, which are like our personal stories, and Atsukan, which are our sacred stories. Those ones have some protocols around how we use them. But storytelling is a really important way of conveying thought and conveying lessons to one another. And it's rooted in theory and in pedagogy. Spirit also means a sense of awe and acts of honoring it. Who doesn't want that in our students, right? The reason that we become professors is because we're studying something and we go, oh my goodness, this is the most beautiful thing, right? I don't know what you study, but probably you had that moment, right? Or the reason that you've gone into your career because it is so beautiful and you want your students to feel that sense of awe as well. And that's spirit, right? Spirit isn't religion. Spirit is a sense of awe and wonder in the world around us. And so we take that awe and we do acts of honoring because of it. There are acts of spirituality, so there needs to be space for that as well. Teaching is ceremony, right? Teaching is a sacred act. We're, we're giving thought to our students. And so it needs to be treated as such, and there needs to be space for things like this, like smudge, right? So in my university, we've got a room, or in my, in my faculty, we have a room that's been um, renovated so that we can smudge when we need to, as we need to, in that space. And there, there, there needs to be room made for physical expressions of the spirituality that we're approaching education with. Um, yeah. And it needs to be learner-centered. So Western education tends to focus on standardization, which has its place. But an indigenous way of thinking will, will instead focus on strength. So I have a story. It, it involves a little one, but I think it translates over. A school that I work with has a little fellow. And we've been kind of tracking these kids who are in immersion education for about five years. And um, this little guy has always been just a little bit behind the age-appropriate standard. We use the standardized test. And, that's what you could focus on, right? Of like, where is this person on the standard? Where are they on the curve? So I was up um, in the community a while ago. We had a meeting. And they asked me to be in the room to talk about this little guy's progress, because he had finally, he was getting age appropriate. It was great. And we talked about that for about four minutes, and about what the challenges that we had are. And then we talked for 45 minutes about his strengths. He's eight years old, and he can pick up medicines in the bush and use them appropriately. He's used them to actually like cure warts, to, cu to cure. Um, illnesses within his community because he's a medicine person. And so we could focus on those difficulties that he's having with literacy and numeracy, or we could focus on what his strengths are. And you can see that with your students as well, right? Where you could focus on where they are in terms of a standard, but you could also focus on where their strengths. Who am I going to tap for grad school? Who's going to be a great teacher? Who should maybe think about kindergarten? Because they've got a gift there. Who sees the person in the special needs child? And maybe should think about going into special needs education. Um, anyone here love marking? <laughs> yeah, I know, me neither. It's the only time I doubt my calling, right, is when I have these papers to mark. So I got thinking about what this strengths-based approach means for multiple modalities. Now I have my students do several papers where everything is created out of their own interest, um, and they can present in any modality they want. So um, they, I have my discovery paper. It's not a paper, even. They can write it if they want to, or they can do a podcast, or they can do a PowerPoint, or they can stand up in front of the class, or they can come just in my office, and it's their subject, whatever they want, and it freaks them out. Because they're like, well, what's the standard? How do I, like, what do I need to meet? And like, it's you. It's what's interesting to you. And many of those papers have become applications to graduate school. Um, so because they shine. They shine in a way that I, that I didn't anticipate at first, because they're able to follow up on their own area of interest as it relates to the content of my indigenous education course. Um, it's based on readiness instead of time. That's a hard one, right? I'm given two hours, and then I have to let them go, and then they have to do everything within the four-month period, and all the deadlines are the same for everybody. But it's not like that in community learning. You go when you're ready. And some people will <coughs> learn things when they're five years old, and other people will be 50, and other people will be 95 when they learn it, because it's when you're ready and when, you're, when you need to serve your community with a responsibility, based on observation, questioning, and one-on-one -on -one work. Um, and so it's really relational, a lot of peer-to-peer. -peer. It's OK that your roles change. We, we really breach those professional standards where you're supposed to maintain distance from your students. Not in our way. I tell my students I love them all the time. I tell them they belong. They say the same to me. And sometimes I'll sit with them, and they'll be an elder. right? They'll, I'll learn from them in a traditional way. And then they'll come into my class, and I'll teach them the book stuff. And we've got a really nice relationality, and that happens within them as well. So you honor them as somebody who comes in as a fire to be stoked rather than a, a vessel to be filled, honoring that they come in with previous knowledge. And the goal is development and um, transformation rather than synthesis. So I'm sure you've all seen Bloom's Taxonomy. That is rooted in Western capitalism. right? It doesn't make it bad. It just means synthesis is the point. right? You're supposed to be put, you're, it, it's all about output, knowledge mobilization. We see that in how we measure professors as well. right? 
But in an indigenous way of thinking, this is where I'm taking from Mohawk thought, it's about learning skills, learning subject matters, but also about the intellectual truth, the transformation that you undergo as a learner, how it changes you as a person, and how it allows you to fulfill your responsibilities to community. So in conclusion, indigenous pedagogy mirrors indigenous epistemology in terms of it being holistic, relational, spirited, and land connected. Um, that means it can be incohesive with Western education in terms of compartmentalization, universalism, disconnection from land, right? Here we are on this tower, we can see the land, but it's really hard sometimes to access it in all of our institutions. I'm, I'm in limestone and 1960s Soviet block architecture. My building is not beautiful. And we can't even see the land in a lot of our classrooms. We don't even have windows. So getting people out and thinking about the land connection can be a real challenge. Secularism, right? We are in institutions that are largely secular. But you can't secularize indigenous ways of thinking because it's all interwoven into the epistemology. And of course, standardized, right? Education is democratic. That everyone should be able to access all kinds of thought and all kinds of knowledge. Not so for us, that you're called to certain kinds of knowledge and certain kinds of action, and you pursue that, right? And so not everybody has to do all the same things all the time. You focus on a little wee one's strengths right from the time they're little. My son is a drummer. He's three. We see it in him already. He will drum. And so we're going to bring him to the drummers. We're going to have him sit at the big drum. He's been sitting at the big drum since he was 18 months old because it's in his soul. So we foster those gifts. Um, so that presents challenges, but we also have some great opportunities, right? We're at a time of tremendous change in post-secondary education, and we can take a look at these ways of knowing and see how they intermarry and how can we borrow from one another in a two-eyed seeing approach um, to really enrich education for everybody. Chimi watch.